three years, women were. Are you still hearing me? So over the years, women were were given little opportunities to be in those uh, disciplines and fields. This is why it's male dominated. So other than this, if you have the will and the passion to do it, then you can definitely uh, reach places. And to finalize on that, I think you should speak up, even if the voice in your he head sounds different than and what's being said in the room, this is exactly the reason why you're there, because you say something different. You have a different approach. You have a different perspective. So be patient, be persistent. It takes time. So never, ever lose sight of your goals. I think you are very brave. You, like you're a beautiful woman. So I can imagine you in that scenario of male dominated, a male dominated field. Did you, and obviously you have that confidence, you have that knowledge in what you do in your workplace. So possibly you'd have some men feeling quite intimidated with you because you're this strong warrior woman in the midst of all of these men. Did you, did you ever feel you had to overwork yourself to prove yourself up against all of these male figures? Yes, definitely. And I think it was all in my head. I thought I had to do this. I thought that if I survive or if I wanted to succeed in this field, I need to be up to their standards or be like men. And as I said, it defeats the purpose. You are invited to that room because you are a woman. You bring something different to the table. So embrace this and celebrate it and just be who you are. We need more Denners in the world to get out there and tell these, <laughs> stand in front of all of these men. And because it does take that courage, that confidence within yourself um, to do that. So I feel proud of you, not even knowing you personally, but um, incredible. Thank you. So the next question, though, as a coaching consultant, how do you do you help organizations and leaders promote inclusion in the workplace? Great question, Sandy. So I transitioned careers because I felt that I wanted to have a bigger impact on the world, right? So I wanted to 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 do something about the psychological well-being of people around me. So I felt like I want to I want to make it a way of living or I want to do this for a living. So as a coaching consultant, I get invited sometimes by teams and organizations and even leaders who tell us, you know, everything is great on our end. Like we were so diverse. We just don't know what's wrong. And it's it's crazy because they truly have diverse population. Uh, they have people from different backgrounds. They have, you know, a lot of females. But what they don't understand is that they lack inclusion. And this is exactly the difference between diversity and inclusion. I like personally to think of it like if you go into the kitchen, you have a great rich pantry full of ingredients, different flavors, different colors, different textures, right? And you think it's awesome, but it's not because you don't have a delicious dish. What is really missing is having the recipe and having the kitchen tools to bring everything together, to really make meaning of everything that you have. It's not enough that they exist. It's very important to have everything combined and working together harmoniously to get something valuable. Therefore, as a coaching consultant, what I do is I start by educating them on what inclusion is. Inclusion is not sitting in a meeting and at the end of the meeting, you'll talk to women or any minority group and be like, okay, do you have anything else to say? It's not. It's really about creating that environment for the person to speak up. I also work with them on creating psychologically safe environments for everyone to voice their opinions and talk about their concerns. One more thing we do is sometimes we review the processes and the policies to make sure that the environment is fair to everyone. And my personally, like, you know, what I, I really like most is developing and celebrating inclusive leadership. If you have inclusive leaders, then trust me, you're very close to realizing the full potential of the teams and individuals you have. Um, I think that was a key thing you've just said there, Denna, you said um, about the processes and policies. I think in so many organizations, they have their diversity and inclusion as one of their tick boxes, but are they really putting it through? Are they really 
uh, educating the employees on the processes and what inclusivity and inclusion, diversity, and what it what it really really means. So we have to have people like you in these organisations and speaking, you know, individually to people to implement that and to let people know because everybody's idea of uh, inclusion can be different because we're all from different cultures, backgrounds. And so we may think differently in these ways, but having individuals who go into organizations and educate them on these to highlight what inclusion is really about is what's paramount and what is needed in every organization. So I think it just brings it down to like better decision making as well. Definitely, definitely. Definitely, yes. And then your last question is, what barriers do you think prevent full inclusion in our societies? Great question, Sandy. So I think what you just touched on is the lack of understanding of what inclusion is about. Um, and this is why you have tokenism, right? It's when you hire women in like leadership positions and visible positions to be like, you know, we met diversity quotas without really understanding how impactful it would be if you were so inviting and so inclusive of everyone. Another barrier is that sometimes the culture of the organizations or the societies or even the leadership, they don't prioritize inclusion. They don't realize that it's the missing ring. Um, one more I like as a barrier is the unconscious biases. These are the ingrained stereotypes, right? Whether you like it or not, it impacts how you make decisions, how you treat people, how you think of people. And I think another barrier that maybe is uh, underexpressed, because I don't like to, to always also take the passive stance. I think the barrier is taking the passive stance, thinking that, okay, organizations need to be inclusive. People need to be inclusive. My employees need to be invited. Where is your role? For any woman or any person who does not feel included, there is a part or there is a role that you play as well. You need to talk about it because believe it or not, sometimes it's not intentional. Maybe this is the best they know. So you need to voice it. You need to talk about it. You need to tell people you don't feel included. You need to express your opinion. At least give them the benefit of the doubt because if it's something that you're not aware of, then they'll definitely help you work on it if, it's, if you talk about it. There is a lack of role models and the communication barriers, as you said, and the, and the lack of training. So thankfully, we have amazing role models like yourself. And I hope companies, you know, they're trying to make this understanding. But as you said, they're not prioritizing it yet. Not, I don't mean all companies, but a lot of companies, they're not prioritizing it and they need to prioritize Um and let people have a voice and feel confident enough to be brave enough to be able to speak to, to speak out. But having people like you in the workforce with a friendly, welcoming nature, hopefully it will give people that confidence to be able to speak up and be a bit more brave to say, look, you know, we don't feel included in this or that. You need to change certain things. Yeah, thank you. Denna, thank you so thank you so much. Your input is um very very much valued, and at the end we'll have some questions. We'll all speak more about this. But Denna, thank you. Thank you. Okay, and moving on now. Got so many amazing, wonder wonderful warriors. So Dr. Nitinda Brown, transformational business leadership and life coach. Prior to this, Nitinda was in corporate healthcare, a doctor also, and leadership roles. And she's exceptionally passionate about women empowerment. So very welcome to you, Dr. Nitinda. Thank you. Um, so let's just get straight on to our first question. So what are some of your personal experiences or reasons that motivated you to think, care about women's empowerment? Thank you. Fantastic question to start with. And a very happy International Women's Day to everyone, to all of us. Every day is our day, but this is a day of celebration. 
So let's have the rest of the year give us more cause to celebrate. So talking about why did I think of inclusion? Great question, because I would like every woman to say uh, to themselves that how can I think about inclusion? See, it's on us as women to include more women. Let's always claim that power. Let's not ask the men to include the women. It's great. Let them do it too. But let's take it upon us. We create our worlds. Yes. So I, uh, as you very kindly said, I am a doctor and a corporate healthcare leader and a transformational business and life coach now. Why did I start thinking about women empowerment? I didn't start thinking about it really. It's very, very close to my heart all my life. First and foremost, because I am a woman and I have lived this life of a very highly competitive corporate career. Prior to that, the highly competitive world of medicine, a difficult world to get into initially and a difficult world to rise through. So I, as I looked back, I, want, I always wonder that what is it that empowered me in my journey and where did I feel limitations? And where I did feel limitations, what helped me, what support and help was available and where was it lacking? And how can I help bridge that gap right now? How can I help more women? I am very, very, very passionate about getting more women on leadership roles. My passion is about getting women into leadership roles. You know, entry-level roles are pretty okay for women now. In the field of medicine, in fact, we have more women. When you see the nursing career has a lot of women. In healthcare, also you have a lot of women. You have a lot of women as doctors. Entry and mid-level roles are pretty okay. But it's leadership. It's leadership roles where you find the women missing. And that's the most important thing because that's where power lies. The power of change, power is everywhere, but the power to bring change does lie more in leadership roles. So my um, take on inclusion is how can we get women to rise? Yes, the world has started accepting more women to a large extent in various roles, but there is the proverbial glass ceiling. How can we burst through the glass ceiling? That's my passion. And I have realize that it's basically primarily three reasons. The first is that we have a lack of both organized and unorganized support in grooming women to become leaders. Secondly, there is not enough mentorship from women themselves. Thirdly, the very lack of women in leadership roles. You have to be in a position of power to enable more. So I believe we need to foster a culture in our corporates, in our businesses, where women are groomed to be leaders. They don't, they don't have to ask. They don't have to step up and say, please groom me. I saw it throughout the corporate world that men are groomed by men. And the fact is that there are more men as leaders. That's the fact right now because of the history that has been. So they automatically, without any grudges mostly, tend to gravitate towards grooming more men. We need to have more women being groomed because that is something which I really saw that men get the grooming at home, at work, Women have to ask for grooming. So we need to first foster a culture where you automatically pick up people on their talent and start grooming them. And maybe initially, intentionally, look at more women, high potential women whom you can groom. Secondly, we need to have more women in leadership roles so that they can mentor these women. It is still very difficult for women to find mentors at high levels. And it is not the easiest to always bond with male mentors, which may not always be the cause. I have to say that all my um, really great aspirational bosses and great mentors were 90 to 95% men. So I was lucky because I found these exceptionally great mentors. But the sad part is that there weren't enough women to mentor me. And I want to change that equation. There were some, but not enough. 95 to 5% in boardrooms, it's, it's, it's a lonely place. So we need more women. And that what, that's what caused me to think of inclusion, that we need more women in leadership roles so that we can bring them up. You know, so because women understand the difficulties faced by other women. We understand what are our personal challenges, which um, somehow are difficult at times for men in the corporate world or men in the business world to understand, and which we shy away from asking. Then comes this whole thing, which Dana so aptly put up of, 
trying to be trying to be someone else you cannot succeed when you're trying to be someone else when you're trying to be better you are already good enough you just need that support to shine through so my role on inclusion my uh, eye on inclusion has been primarily for this reason that okay there's a lot of women in base level and mid level roles but let's get them up to leadership that's where i work Oh, absolutely. And with again, with people like you supporting and being a good role model, hopefully we will see more women shining coming through. Because once they feel safe in their environment, they can contribute so many of their skills. And I think now with society, um, you know, I have two daughters and a granddaughter. And it's lovely even seeing that generation of my daughters. They don't see color. They don't see um, different um, people, uh, religion or anything. They just see equality, the, the way they're brought up, thankfully. And that doesn't, uh, that, it, that doesn't apply to every one of their age groups. But I hope then with my granddaughter, with their generation, it gets even better, it, it improves, it gets even better. And I know there's a lot of, um, I was based in the Middle East for some time in 2018 initially when Saudi was just, just going through some of the changes. But me as a Westerner appearing there initially, I felt very, what have I done? Why am I here? What am I, what's going on? This is so different to my, my life. I wasn't there for too long in 2018, but I returned then in 2022. It's very different, very different. It's when I met Lubna and lots of the other women warriors and um, big changes, which I see changing. And I hope men support this. I think there's a very long way to go still, a long way to go. But having women warriors like yourselves who contribute to these monthly meetings or to just speaking to other people, it's building a bigger, stronger world of women. And come on, I'm just saying, but women have a lot of knowledge, a lot of wisdom. We're great at chatting and communicating with each other. So women can bring so much more to the table. I'm oh, just I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> we do love men though. We love men who support women. And I think I think that's a, that's a very key a key point to make. So we're not just, well, it's just gotta be women. We just want equality. We want, you know, whoever can bring something to the table. Right, okay, and your next question. So you have a, a wealth of incredible diverse experience. You coach ambitious people and organizations. So describe your leadership style and how you lead others. Is it different, do you think, from your male counterparts? Okay, fantastic. Thank you for asking that. And uh, I just add this little bit that I also traveled to Saudi quite a bit when I was with Astadium Healthcare. I traveled to Riyadh quite a bit. And uh, it was a different world, yes. Um, but I did see one thing that, you know, uh, and I say this to all the women of Saudi especially, that the men listened when we spoke. They saw the merit in the discussion and they when there was a need to think gets done, uh, sorry, to get things done, they listened and they did. So there's, the world is open for the women out there. I think they just have to step up to that. And God bless uh, the king for doing, doing what he did. All right, my leadership style. So my leadership style has always been very inclusive. Um, I don't tell people what to do. I have led very large teams uh, over the, 22 years in healthcare that I did. I never tell people what to do. I get them together. I get them to understand what is their role in it, what is to be done, and then what's their part that they need to be playing, and then let them do it. I give them clarity. I was once asked long ago, am I a process person or people person? I said, I'm both actually. I get the people to understand the processes, and that's it. That's actually it. I get people clarity, and this is what I saw. I've had a lot of teams come to me. It had become a bit of a thing that Dr. Nathan can turn around difficult teams. And I was told that these are difficult teams. And there were times when I was told you can change people if they don't work. 
I have never had reason in my entire career to change even one person. All people have inherently been very capable people. The only reason why they did not perform I saw was that they did not have clarity on what to do. So I'm very big on getting people great clarity on what they do. The second and the most important thing actually possibly bigger than clarity is I help people build their strengths. You have to allocate the job to the person as per their strength. If you're going to judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, they're going to fail. So you got to get people to shine and then they don't perform at 100%, they perform at 200% because they're looking for that applause, you know, when they're shining. So then I get them to build their strengths. I help people, I help my teams create a framework. I help them create a framework around organizing and creating a tasks, which gives them leverage of optimizing their functionality, getting their little uh, pieces of character into their job and keeping their life comfortable. Once these three pieces are done, then I hold them very accountable. That's definitely there. I hold them very, very accountable. Uh, leadership styles as different from men, well, um, especially the last 10, 11 odd years at uh, very senior leadership roles, I realized that there are, when leadership really matters, it's not about men and women. Leaders are leaders. You know, they have certain qualities. I don't think my leadership style differs from another man or another man's leadership style would differ from any other good leader. Essentially, leadership is an attitude. It's not really a skill also. The one thing that I did notice is that women are more empathetic by nature, but then really good male leaders are also very empathetic. So I wouldn't differentiate very much. Um, the only thing I would say is that I did not try very hard to be a man in the leadership roles. And I would be lying if I would say that I didn't try it hard, early, hard enough earlier on in my career. Earlier on in my career, I did. Because, and I did feel this need to push through. I did feel the need to constantly prove that I am better than the others. But there came a time when I said, okay, this is it, this is me, and this is what I do, because I realized that I am hired, I am here for my authenticity. So my personal leadership role, yes, my personal leadership role is very direct. I am very, very direct. Um, sometimes to a fault, perhaps. I like to keep things very clean and very clear. I do not uh, indulge in office politics, uh, nor do I manipulate. And uh, luckily that worked very well for me. There was a time when I thought maybe I need to learn some of that, but I gave up <laughs> and it worked very well. So yes, that's my personal leadership style is. Um, and it's, it's good to have different leadership styles because people can relate to you and it may, your leadership style may work for someone, but it may not work for somebody else. And you need to build these alliances Um and people understand then your style of leadership and that's the way it's going to be successful. Or if somebody doesn't like the way you're leading, then they're not, it's gonna go in one ear out the other and it's gonna be pointless. Um, um, but finally though, how do you inspire inclusion? So I believe in, uh, you know, inclusion is uh, a tool with two sides, right? And one is for the world to open a door for us which there's been a lot of talk about, but the second more important is for us to have the ability to step and walk through that door. So I inspire inclusion, like I said, since I work more at senior leadership roles by building powerful women. That's my passion in life, that I help build really extremely powerful women, women who have no reason to look for validation, women who have no reason to doubt themselves, women who know exactly what they're capable of, of what all they can give, how all they can contribute. I also inspire um, inclusion by telling the younger generations that there is absolutely nothing that you can or cannot do. There is absolutely no role in this world that is limited because of your gender, as long as you have the passion and the drive. However, if you don't have the passion and the drive, don't ask for a role. So I want women to be powerhouses. You know, you have to be so flat out fantastic as opera says at what you do that your talent cannot be ignored. 
So build yourself to be invited, not to have to ask for inclusion, for the world to clamor to have you there, you know? And by highlighting spaces, this is very important. This is something which I do very directly. I highlight spaces in senior leaderships in large organizations and businesses where there are no women. And I ask those organizations and spaces and the men there to see that what is the reason that they don't seem to have women in their leadership roles? And I have seen that it almost always gets them to reflect because there are senior roles, they're intelligent people. It almost always gets them to reflect that yes, they're missing out on something. And maybe they have practices in their organizations which are not encouraging women to move up to senior leadership. It's okay to have one thing to say, welcome women at base roles, at mid-level roles, but in senior leadership roles, in uh, director level roles, in the board of director roles. Wow. I openly ask organizations and businesses to check whether they have equality at the highest level where it matters. I well, hope that answers. Good, good intentions alone won't get us there. You know, they have to have a proactive mindset and it does take a lot of hard work, but, you know, people are moving it in that direction slowly, but they are moving in that direction. But it's great to have you as a leader uh, within these organizations because, Hopefully it will all, that people are listening. They're starting to listen now. Listen, yes. but they need to act. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Listen, I need to act. And one last thing, you know, ladies, take, claim your power. You don't need to ask for it. Just claim your power. Shine your strength. Work on yourself. Don't work on the world outside you. But when you are so powerful, the whole world wants you to be a part of their businesses, their career growth charts, their organizations. They want you. In the end, a business wants to grow and it wants people who can help it grow. Their gender stops matter. Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Nitinda. Your input, again, it's so valuable. It's very um, inspiring to hear the wisdom and to share your knowledge. Thank you. Again, we'll go back to you at the end, just conscious of time. So we will move on. But thank you so, so very much. It's fabulous listening to you, ladies. It, it really is. It's it's so inspiring. So and we'll move on to now Amal Farahat. Hello, Amal. Thank you so much. Hello. For hi. Us. Good morning. Welcome to London. Good morning. Um, so Amal has worked 20 years in quality management in various sectors, at times, again, only one, one of two women in a leadership team of over 10 men. Now a life coach focusing on stress women face, which we all know about that. We do face a lot of stress, us ladies. Um, so as a cognitive behavioral stress management coach, you are used to dealing with stress related individuals and situations. Have you experienced any incidents in the workplace where you have felt excluded or treated unfairly? Um, well, it's an interesting question, Sandy. Um, first of all, thank you and happy Women's Day to everyone. Uh, to us, I started, when I first started working, I was mostly surrounded by men, male colleagues, and I grew up with the idea um, I have to be, not, if not as good as the men, I have to be better. It was never the question about having, you know, women or female power. It was just always proving to men, I'm just as good. And which meant doing things even better than them. And it was all well, it went okay. I never noticed any issues until I actually got married. And then especially when I became a mother. So first, when I became, when I got married, it was, um, I started more wanting to be at home. And suddenly working late hours, coming, not be getting home on time um, for any meal or anything, uh, kind of put some stress on me. But the feedback I was got, even from other women, was, well, you have to teach your husband to be supportive of you. If he's not supportive, he has to support you and your goals. And this is what it means to be a powerful woman. And 
for a time, I kind of, I put that pressure on my husband. Well, if you supported me, if you really loved me, you would see this is important. You would let me be, go out there and work. Work meaning I was working, but it would be where coming home at after six o'clock, eight o'clock at night was okay. Having meetings until 10 o'clock at night would be okay and accepted or on the weekends. Then the biggest challenge was when I became a mother. I myself, I wanted, um, I wanted to be with my child, with my baby. I wanted to be able to nurse. Um, being at work longer hours uh, made me feel that stress, that pressure, trying to be in both places at the same time, mm -hmm. but not being in either place 100%. I even had from a call, very well-meaning, and she it did come from a space of love. It was more, well, you have to teach your child to be independent, to call the nanny or to be with the nanny. Uh, don't even try to nurse, use the bottle and just put the baby to the side because you still have to build your career. And it that made me feel I had to pull away. It was even from uh, some of the men, one of them were saying, they felt disappointed in me because they thought my career, when I said, I need to take, I need to be able to leave on time. I have a newborn baby at home. I want to look after. I won't be able to work on weekends. Mm. And the response was, I am very disappointed in you. Oh. Yes, things like that did not help with inclusion. And it was then afterwards, I realized it's not a matter of men versus women. It's actually, inclusion is much bigger. It's understanding or realizing we all go through phases. And through these phases, we have different needs. Men or fathers need to be at home with their children just as much. The whole culture of um, it's accepted you have your full days of work and then all the meetings having them in the evening that's when as families we need to be together not just at work um, different things uh, somebody might have um, going through an illness or a family member an important family member going through illness they're just because they're not giving 100 or 200% like they used to, doesn't mean they're less dedicated. Just they're going through a phase where other parts of their life need to take a priority. Amal, you um, know, say, sure. saying sorry to interrupt. Um, I mean, obviously uh, a lot of women can relate if they have children. It's That's really sad to hear that because it's what they're disappointed in you because you've brought one of the best gifts and hardest jobs in life, a child into the world. And they're disappointed that you're trying to do a job and do your full-time job with your, with your family. Um, so hats off to you and all the women who do manage to work, bring up a family, look after a home. I mean, you know, I think exactly. men, if they are not, as you said, you had to remind your husband, look, it's really important you're here and you play your role as well. And you're here for dinner and with the children, like with the family as well. But I mean, I think that's, there's still a lot of work done on that side of things. Isn't there? Yes, exactly. But yes. Yeah, but so, even in yeah. often... Yeah. I've worked with companies where they try, they want to increase engagement and they do want to do the inclusion. So they'll have, for instance, celebrations within the workplace, uh, which is nice. However, there are certain parts, aspects. Yes, it brings the people together. It brings the team together. However, in a way that is suitable for 
certain people, not everyone. Some would be like, well, I would rather let's focus on work or let's do these meetings a little faster mm -hmm. so we can get done and we can leave. We can take care of other things that we have to take care of. So it's more the aspect of inclusion, finding out what different people, what they need. Some want to, as humans in general, we want to be part of a group. We want to belong. We don't want to be excluded. But if we start feeling that challenged and um, overly pressure, we have to belong, we have to appear or show up in a certain mold that doesn't help us to be included. And that's when people tend to pull away and either form their own groups or just kind of, that's where, for instance, we have that uh, silent, um, uh, what was the term? Um, silent quitting. Because they no longer feel they don't belong into this group anymore. And it's opening the discussions and especially people at certain times when they feel vulnerable, it's gonna be very challenging for them very hard to open up and voice out what their needs are. So it's more about kind of, for me, when I work with people telling them to look within themselves with curiosity, but also be available or be ready to look at other people with the same curiosity. Absolutely, indeed. And we can, again, I think a lot of companies, they miss out on a lot of potential of women who, well, I, they want to be with their child, they want to be with their family, but they also yes. want to do, and they are very capable of doing a very, very good job. Yes. And they just need to be more exactly. open-minded to be more inclusive in that way. Um, thank you, Amal. So, but... How have you built confidence and or resilience over the course of your career in a predominantly male-driven country? A uh, big part of it is uh, building my own self-confidence, having constantly always reminding myself what my goals are and stopping from once in a while, stopping myself if I'm, when I'm doing something or going along asking questions of why am I doing this? And then reminding me, okay, this is my goal. Are these things aligned with me? And then just with kindness, responding. Can we all ensure when that is? Please. 99% cover. Yeah, there's one person. Sandy, it's a okay. I muted. Yes. There, okay. So I say building the resilience was um, focusing on uh, myself, my goals, and building my own self confidence, and reminding myself, as it is for me, everything is about me. That's the same thing with other people, whether it's the men or the women. They're and reactions to me it's about them themselves and their, their own issues so in a way not taking it personally so, although I don't but just reminding well the way they respond does it really have to do are they responding to me or are they responding to something else going on with themselves well you're cu cultivating a really positive mindset and you're because you've built that confidence within yourself, you're standing yes. strong. And I think this is, uh, some people, unfortunately, women, they back down. If you're being told I'm disappointed in you, you're suddenly, well, am I good enough? Am I capable of um, doing exactly. this role? And because it's tough, um, family, career, obviously your family should be taking priority anyway. Um, but why should your career not be up there also, you know, when you've worked so hard prior to this? Um, yes. Also being kind to um, ourselves, that 
maybe perhaps this is now just going through a phase. Everything will pass. Yes. So even yes, being it's different when you have ever like whether you have young children, eventually they're going to grow up. So it's I'm not always stuck in this place. Just hold on and keep on going. Yeah. Stay strong, keep going. With uh, the focus of what you want, your goals. Have be very clear about what your goals are. Yes, yes. And, um, but finally, Amal, sorry, we'll move on. Um, having worked in industries where as a woman you are the minority, what strategies can work well to promote inclusion in the workplace? I mean, you've covered just some of them then anyway. Um, so looking at, um, like Dina said, Dina said, with the policies and procedures, um, and the and, uh, Nintendo also said about the internal culture. Sometimes, often, just because we have them written down, have having the policies, are they actually being implemented or, or not? Um, opening communication and giving voices that are not speaking up. Find a way to go to them, seek them out, and ask them in a safe space what do they need i think a safe space a safe and supportive space is one of the key things because you when you examine culture and in the, in these environments and you want people to be in a safe place that they can express themselves and their concerns without feeling judged or yes. will they be reprimanded yes. because they've They've spoken up, which should be, they should be able to do this. Um, but yes, Amal, thank you so much. It's very, again, very important points um, for people to take on board, for men and for women to take on board and to have that understanding. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, we have Lubna Faki. She's in Saudi Arabia also. Um, just so welcome. I know Lubna's an educator. I know Lubna from Saudi. So it's lovely um, to be reconnected with you, Lubna, and to know that you've gone on now to coaching and you empower women and youth through education in Saudi Arabia. But how can you inspire and create success? Hello, everyone. Uh, marhaba, hola, bonjour, hello, uh, namaste, ciao, jambo. I don't know, wherever people are listening. First, thank you. And actually, your time today is actually inspiring inclusion. So thank you for your time and thank you for listening to us. Um, you know, really, uh, after listening to already the much uh, professional and uh, colleagues of ours today, I'm actually uh, kind of narrowing it down more to a more humble base. Um, for me, uh, inspiring inclusion really, or just plain and simple inclusion is where you have a space for everyone, where everyone has uh, a, a, a time uh, to, to speak up, uh, to speak their mind, their opinion, what they want. And, um, you know, I, I never really thought I'd be an educator or a teacher, let alone in leadership. And, uh, but that's what was ordained here for me in Saudi. And uh, I've not really looked back. I'm actually originally from India and I'm a nationalized Saudi. Uh, Saudi is my home now. Uh, has been for a while and uh, education actually was you could say one of the very few options that I had years ago to step into and it was either the hospital or the education and I'm really really very glad that I chose education 
because uh, education really has, uh, you know, opened my path, which in turn has opened the path for so many other women. And I say mainly women because here in this country, we are even up to now more uh, closed within the women uh, circle. Although now, you know, mashallah, it's um, it, it, there's been a massive change. But in the past two decades, even three decades, actually, uh, it's been, you know, more and more women-oriented workplace or women-oriented uh, social life, you know. Unless I got out of here, then it was a different story. But education really, I, I, I see... Um, I see around me now my students who have made a name for themselves. Uh, they're independent, confident, you know, innovators, initiators in so many different fields uh, in the kingdom, uh, globally and in the kingdom. And the opportunities are abundant. And I'm happy to see that they are actually uh, making use of this. Um, but for me, again, inclusiveness is not is not just to that big, wide, global um uh, world. Inclusiveness should start sure. from your backyard, in your backyard, and especially for those people who are underprivileged, who do not have a chance, who do not hardly get any chance to even speak up. And I think we know who we are surrounded by at home, in the workplace, those other people who do not get a chance. And for me, that inclusivity or inclusiveness is so important. You know, we as privileged women get a chance. You know, we are bold, we are brazen, we can speak up, we can demand we don't need somebody to open the door for us. You know, we, we barge our way at what we think is good. But then we are also, also surrounded by so many people that don't have this chance. And for me, I speak for inclusivity for them. I open the door for them because sometimes not everybody can open the door for themselves. And even like, about success it's very personal you know you don't have to be a celebrity you don't have to be a ceo uh to be successful you don't have to have a lot of money but if you put a smile on someone's face if you eased somebody's difficulty at some point in their lives if you made somebody's life better that is success that is success contentment for you and more important for that other person. So for me, all this is very important. And uh, I try in my circle, in my community, to bring that inclusivity to people, to the common man, to the common person, uh, be it man or woman, really. Uh, but yes, our topic is mainly uh, women, but man, uh, men, women, and children who do not have a voice. And it is important that in all our glory that we give these people a voice. And as Dina also mentioned about unconscious biasness, it's there in humans, it's there. Even me, no matter how much I preach about, you know, uh, being non-judgmental and uh, unbiased, it is there inside. And that's what we need to fight. We need to fight that so that those small people, those people who don't have a chance are brought in, are given opportunities in whatever way, it may be very small, but... And this is where I stand for inclusivity uh, in every way. And like I say, every small step, but yes. creates a big impact. Love, now that's, that's very, very humbling. And as an educator, um, 
as you said, a lot of people are unfortunately don't even have that privilege with that to, to be educated in the world. And I think particularly, you know, let's all spare a thought for what's going on in the world at the minute. It's, mm. it's horrendous. It's so sad, the atrocities and uh, these innocent people who are caught up in unfortunate, these unfortunate wars, let alone other countries who children don't even get the opportunity to have an education to even begin their lives you know what what hope do they can they have um but that's lovely to hear and as you said it's it's very humbling as you said it's women men it's for it's it's everybody everybody um, i just want to end with one little uh, uh actually example of something i'm involved in sure. and again it involves women children and men i uh, support and work uh, with a therapeutic writing um, group. I've been working with them for 10 years and we actually help uh, differentiated individuals, be it children, men, uh, male, female. And we work with them at, a, at a, a stables and a very close friend of mine actually runs it. And I help... And that gives me immense contentment and success when you see the child or the individual make progress as to their condition. Some are extreme paralytic conditions. Some are just, you know, they're okay, but it makes a very, very different, a big difference. And the reason is including, not seeing where they come from some can't pay either so it doesn't matter if you can pay you it's fine but if you can't pay you are still included and that's where inclusivity comes well Thank i mean you. i will want to ask you how do you inspire inclusion you've just said it that you <laughs> absolutely what what an incredible initiative and when i'm over is that in jeddah Yes, yes. Okay, when much. I when I return, I'd love to visit. That sounds absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. It's quite hard. It touches your heart, you know, to know, to allow, you're allowing everybody. And that is exactly what inclusion is about. It's not about just race, religion, uh, diversity, disabilities. Right. You've got, it covers so many, so many areas, you know, even children, if they have any learning difficulties that Absolutely. they could be in a mainstream school and not feel like, well, why am I different mom? Why am I, do I have to be excluded out of here? You know, right. I mean, there is, I admire you and everything you do. You know, I know you've been principal um, like in the education system for so long. So obviously you make a huge difference. And as you said, you must have students you're very proud of. They've, they've made a way for themselves a name for themselves so it's just we, we, we've got some big names. Uh, Basma Khareji, I think uh, people in Jeddah know her. <laughs> and I've got others too. Yeah, yeah. Oh, listen, we like name dropping. That's okay. <laughs> Look, especially when you're proud of someone, of what they've done or or, or what they've achieved. No, I, I, could, I could give you a big list, but I'll keep it down. <laughs> we'll save it for another talk yes, um, yes guys yes. i'm conscious of time so i'm just gonna if you lady speakers can just unmute yourselves um first of all obviously i just want to thank you all very much for being a part of this very important um topic inspire inclusion on international women's day but i just like for between ourselves is there anything else you would like to add just just very briefly Anything you'd like to add and, or is there any women in the world who really inspire you? So like, obviously we have like Mary Curry, you know, she continually inspires me for her determination to earn the education she wanted and the lengths she went to in order to achieve it are incredible. She made incredible contributions to science and her work is on every periodic table. So she's um a very lifelong, incredible inspiration. But over to you, ladies. Is it anyone speaking? 
was some good talking. Great. I was just going to add something that is inspired by everything we said today. I think it's it's amazing, everything that you ladies mentioned today. I'm a big believer that what goes around comes around. Mm -hmm. So this is just a reminder that as much as we are doing to make sure women are included, it's also a reminder for us to watch what we do and how we think to make sure we are inclusive of others as well. Because inclusion is not only limited to, to gender or like, you know, minority groups, even the different types of personalities, the people who are naturally like quiet or, you know, unprivileged. So it's just a reminder of, you know, whatever you give to the world is going to come back in a way. Here, here. Beautiful. Yes, yes. If I may, I would like to encourage women to step into their power. I would like, you know, inclusion. Uh, we grew up with this inclusion, gender equality, and I know some parts of the world need it more than other. But it's also a way of learning from the curve of other people. Is that the times are now different, no matter where we are. So instead of, I want this mindset inside that I really don't need another person's help. I would like to have that support. I would love to have that support, by, but by myself, I am a lot. I want every young girl to know this, that by myself, I am a lot. And I would love to have support, but I don't need it. I want women to know that you are capable of everything. So. Look at your limiting beliefs. The world is within. What is stopping me is inside my head much more than it is outside. Yes, there is some parts outside, but what is inside is so much more. Even if we take the case of Saudi, for example, and I hope this is not a touchy topic. I know it's not um, by law anymore that to cover their hair, but most people do because the belief is inside. And it takes time. So this is a very small uh, and a very in our face example. For all other things, where are we fearing judgment? Where are we fearing criticism? And are we letting that fear be so big that we are not really living? Mm. I want us to do this for all the women around us that just try, just try. Face that fear a little bit today. It will be easier tomorrow. Yes, it's great when other people help us, but nobody can help you as much as you can help yourself. And for that yourself, find, find yourself a mentor, some support, but it's up to you. you go ahead. Thank Sorry, you. I'm, I'm just going to interrupt. Just one thing. It's, like you said, it's a touchy topic. <laughs> uh, just to correct, if I may, the law does not, the law has not changed here. Uh, being a Muslim country, it is still the law for Muslims, not by the law to cover your head for women. Okay, okay. I didn't, so I didn't. it is more it is more for foreigners. I myself don't cover, okay, but that's my choice as well. But the law has not really changed. Just to let you know that. Oh, yeah. that's nice. I mean, I don't know if it's Just nice to, to, yeah, yeah, but that's. On the side, I just picked it up as an example. No, no, no. I know, I know, but because you know, <laughs> just just to clear it's any message. Nice. It's uh, it's. Do you know? I think all of your com uh, comments are so relevant, and so you all, each and every one of you, have inspired even just me personally today. I mean, hearing what you say, you don't need anyone. It would be lovely to have that support. You don't need anyone to get you ahead, obviously a little support sometimes helps a little bit, but if you can just, you know, I, I'm a, I was a single parent. I brought up my kids myself and did everything myself in life. I would have loved a bit of support, but it's not stopped me from doing what I've done and carrying on, you know, getting through life as we do. And I know that applies to many women. So again, even with, you know, wearing the head scarf, whether it's the, uh, it's the law or not, I think women making their own decisions and uh, what's within them and how they want to behave in society. And again, who who was it who said, you know, what what comes around goes around, you know, what you put into life, you get back out of life. 
And um, I just thank you all very much for your contributions today. You know, I just like to add just sorry, I just like to add one little thing just for us to all to remember that as we are embracing and including young girls, little girls uh, to shine into their light, just to be a little bit cautious that we are not excluding young boys because the message is what we say. Not only the girls are listening, the boys as well. And whatever we say about men being not supportive or not the way we want them to be, the message we're giving the, these boys is yes. to be that way. So just always to be cautious that there's always a young child around us listening and picking up. And that is what how we're forming our future. Thank you, Amal. So, you're very thank you very, very much, everyone. No, you're you're very true. And obviously, when we talk about because this is a women's um platform for women to shine, and we do speak about women all throughout. Obviously, we are yes. this is why I always include men on my events, also. So yes. men, women, boys, girls, everyone, because exactly. I am a very big uh equality. Yes. fan of people so um yes. that's a very very valid point you've made and obviously you've got a lot of women who are very unsupportive <laughs> a lot of girls who are unsupportive we're just trying to build this create this platform here so that it lets women shine and say yes. their piece but in support um and i mean on that note i will be in dubai next month um for an in person networking event and also a ladies lunch Details are to follow, but um, I am hoping to get back to Saudi as well at some stage because the amount of amazing women and men I met while for my time in Saudi was in absolutely incredible. And I have a big piece of my heart stays there also. And I can't wait till I do return um, and hopefully build this network with you incredible people. Uh and anyway, again, a big, huge, huge thank you to everybody for taking part today. Sorry about the blips early on for the LinkedIn Live, but it has been recorded. So I will send that out with an edited version so that everybody can receive these wonderful awesome. ladies' contact details. So if you want to get in touch with any of them, please either contact direct or contact through me. Um, and let's just, as we end, just spare a thought for all of those suffering in our world and remind ourselves how fortunate we are. And a Ramadan Mubarak sending wishes for a very peaceful Ramadan, as I know it starts, is it Saturday or Sunday? I think it's Tuesday, if I'm not wrong. I'm or wrong. Tuesday, it could be. <laughs> Monday. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, we know it's coming up and we know what a peaceful time. So yes. let's hope, pray for peace in our world and amongst us. And thank you all very much once again, guys. Thank you. Thank Have you. a fabulous thank day. You. Thank you.